The Northwest Florida legislative delegation has a new look for 2017. Term limits and elections have brought some new members on board. Tonight, you'll meet most of them, and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions about issues affecting Northwest Florida. And we're interact. Well, I should say we're live, as you can tell, interactive on radio and on television from the Phyllis and Mike Johnson studio. Legislative review dialogue with the delegation is straight ahead. This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Hey, and a very pleasant good evening, everyone. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for joining us. In addition to our television broadcast on WSRE TV, we're also being heard on News Radio 1620 and on 92.3 FM. The Florida Legislative Session convenes March 7th. With Governor Scott wanting tax cuts and House and Senate leadership vowing to cut waste, the budget battle in the Sunshine State could get quite fierce. For the Northwest Florida delegation, making sure the bulk of the BP oil spill money stays in the counties most affected by the disaster will be paramount. House and Senate leaders seem to favor the idea, but with so much money on the line, it may not be a slam dunk. Tonight, we'll discuss this and other issues imported to Northwest Florida and the state as a whole. In doing so, we want to hear from you, the constituents of Northwest Florida. This is a forum for you to ask your legislators questions about issues that most concern or interest you. You can do so by email or phone. The email address is questions at WSRE.org. Or if you prefer, call us at 850-484-1223 or toll free at 1-800-239-WSRE. Our panel this evening consists of both new and familiar faces. Doug Broxson is a familiar face in a new role. He served six years in the Florida House of Representatives before being elected to the Florida Senate. Senator Broxson serves District 1. His counterpart in the Senate serving District 2 is George Gaynor. Senator Gaynor is a newcomer to the delegation, but not to politics. He served as a county commissioner in Bay County. Senator Gaynor is unable to join us this evening due to a scheduling conflict. And now, our representatives from the Florida House. Representative Clay Ingram serves District 1, and he is the veteran of the group. Representative Ingram was first elected to the Florida House in 2010. Representative Frank White is a newcomer to the delegation and to politics, but brings with him an extensive legal and business career. Representative White represents District 2. J.R. Williamson is the District 3 representative. While a newcomer to the Florida House, he is not a newcomer to politics. Representative Williamson served as a Santa Rosa County Commissioner from 2014 to 2016. District 4's representative is Mel Ponder. He is new to the Florida House, but not to politics. He is the former mayor of Destin, Florida. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us this evening and welcome and congratulations on your election or re-election as the case may be. Senator Broxson, I will begin with you. What's your main focus for 2017? I think the main fo focus is going to be the BP oil spill. We've got $300 million of sitting over in the general fund. That's our money. And we have to convince 156 members that uh, that is our money. And uh, that's the reason I filed that bill as my first bill along with Senator Gaynor and Montford. And we believe it should go into Triumph. Maybe we could tweak tri Triumph a little bit, but it should be transferred immediately to be used in the Panhandle. Now, thus far as I understand it, House and Senate leadership seem to be on board with that. Is that an accurate statement? On, on, yes, I think so. It's just a matter of how that money is to be distributed, what means, and that's yet to be determined. Representative Ingram, your your main focus for 2017. Sure, and, and Senator Broxson, you know, uh, an, an overarching thing we're going to all be concerned about is triumph for sure. Right. Uh, and I'll, I'll go back to when uh, he and I were first elected in 2010. Though the economy was in shambles, you know, the worst economy I've ever lived through, uh, and a lot of other folks as well. But uh, our focus was on, you know, cutting taxes, repealing regulations that are, uh, you know, we've cut 4,000 regulations, which is, you know, almost unheard of. If you told us back in 2010 we would, you know, make that kind of dent in the regulatory environment, it'd be tough to have believed, believed us back then. But, uh, you know, the focus, though, was on creating jobs. 
And I think that's going to be something that if we rest on our laurels, we could lose a lot of the momentum we've gained since 2010. So uh, waking up every day, making sure that we keep our eye on the ball, keeping this a, a great regulatory and, and tax climate in Florida and continue to make gains there is going to be something that we'll wake up every day. I know I will and keep my focus on on that. Representative White, you're new to the game. What's on your agenda? So first priority is, is the same as, um, as, as Clay and Doug. I think that we have to have our top priority be protecting the Triumph funds. Uh, we all remember the oil spill. It was here. It was on our beaches, the eight counties uh, between Perdido Key and Panama City. That's where the damage was done. And so any time a, a massive amount of money flows through government, it's, uh, it's, it's a target. And so we are all going to be vigilant to make sure that those funds are invested where the damage was done. Um, my, my main focus will be on health care issues this session. So I'm, I've been assigned to three health care committees and I look forward to bringing our values to Tallahassee to try to try to solve some of our problems in the state there. And Representative Williamson, you're new to the legislature. What's your main focus? Of course, Triumph, like everybody's already mentioned, you know, accessibility to the public as a new state representative, want to make sure that you're, you're the liaison between your citizens and state agencies. For everyday work cases, I've put together a great staff in the district. Uh, look forward to uh, to serving those cases. But then from a legislative standpoint, transportation is something that I certainly have a heart for. I served as chairman of the TPO when I was a county commissioner. We have uh, we have a growing region, a growing county in Santa Rosa and Okaloosa that I represent, and then Escambia where we're here, are, where we are today. We need to make sure that our transportation needs uh, keep up with that growth. So that'll be a main focus as we move into the session over the next two years. Representative Ponder, I'll pose the same question to you. Your focus for 17. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, you know, I think overarching for me, one of the things I campaigned on is foundationally preserving and protecting the values that make Northwest Florida great. And I highlighted three things, and uh, I, I campaigned under these three things that I intend to kind of work through in session. One is, as we've heard already, is building a regional team, building a culture of family in Northwest Florida, focusing on what unites us as opposed to divides us. And, and paramount is the, is the BP oil spill money. And I think when we collectively come together and fight as family, fight as a unit of Northwest Florida, I think it sends a message and also puts a stake in the ground that that's valuable to us. Uh, it's a generational changer, as I've said many times, and so I think that's paramount, as we've heard before. Also, a lot of our problems are regional in nature. We need to be on the same page working with our, our comrades and teammates to our east and west so that we can focus on some regional solutions. Secondly is the education arena, focusing on you know, workforce development training, partnering with our colleges and universities, that we have incredible colleges and universities in Northwest Florida, and working on a workforce standpoint so that our kids come out, whether um, they're ready, trade ready after high school perhaps, or, or even after college, I want our graduating seniors to work here in our market. I've got teenagers and young adults that if they get, when they graduate, I want them to come back and work in our market. I don't want them to go somewhere else. Then lastly, putting extra honor on our military. I mean, our fighting men and women. Uh, it's an it's a amazing heritage of Northwest Florida. Um, continue to strengthen that relationship because if Brat comes sniffing around, and they will, I want them to look especially at Northwest Florida and say, I'm not touching it because that military family's strong. And so those are the three highlight things that I'm looking forward to working on this year. Let me get just, and I'll, th I'll throw this up kind of as a jump ball here real quick because I'm sure we may toss this back and forth throughout the evening here, but we mentioned Triumph funds. Explain <clears throat> sort of what Triumph is. I'll get anybody to jump in on that. Triumph was a corporation created to receive any funds that came to the state from BP. It is a beautifully written uh, legislation. It has built in <clears throat> it four audits. It requires the board of directors, which there are five, to be under sunshine to fill out their financial reports every year to make reports to the President of the Senate, the Speaker of the House, and the Governor twice a year. It is one of the most transparent corporations ever created by the state. And the people that have been designated are good people, good citizens. And for them to go through that kind of scrutiny, to be on that board, is a testimony to the strength of Northwest Florida. We have to do some tweaking because we anticipated a lump sum settlement so the fees and the investment income is based on that principle but with few tweaks we can make that a great vehicle to receive that money have autonomy over that money to create jobs and to build this economy in the counties that were most affected ideally is what is is the plan with it Speaking of, of just kind of an overall what people might think about uh, in the state of Florida, there's obviously a new regime in Washington, D.C. How do you think things are going to be different at the state level coming down from Washington, Clay? Yeah, I'll say this. Uh, uh, the election in, in November was uh, 
uh, at the you know, federal and state level was an absolute rejection of status quo. And I think that the leadership in Tallahassee in the House and Senate uh, came into uh, power with that mindset as well, to absolutely reject the status quo, to be more transparent than ever, to take more public input than ever. Uh, and so I think that we're seeing everything through that lens uh, and, and it sort of strikes at our core belief of, of Northwest Florida. And so uh, I think it's something that we all embrace and uh, are sort of looking forward to you know, work, working in this environment of rejecting the old way of doing business and, and doing things in a way that really are, are more uh, the way things we would, the way we would do things in Northwest Florida anyway. So uh, sort, sort of exciting from our point of view. There is new leadership, obviously, in the House and in the Senate. What do you make of it? How, what, do, what do you think so far? I'm, I'm pretty encouraged. You know, I'd, I'd love, I mean, from a Speaker Corcoran's perspective for the House, he's ex extreme transparency. Um, I think for all of us and how I believe we all conduct ourselves prior to this point in time, I don't think it's a major change for any one of us because I think that's kind of how we operate in, you know, anyway. Uh, he's big on accountability. Uh, which I think, again, uh, represents the values of Northwest Florida. So that wasn't a big change for us. Also, you know, in terms of how he wants to work with lobbyists and disclosures, and, and he's making some positive changes, I think, from the top down, uh, and he walks them out. And so uh, for me, and I think uh, maybe on behalf of all of us, I don't want to speak for the others, but I think, it, you know, I think I'm, I'm pretty encouraged about the leadership he brings to the table and not only holding himself accountable, but the whole house as a whole. Very good. Go ahead, please. Jeff, I'd, I'd, I'd agree completely in that, Speaker Corcoran started by putting up a rule that we all voted for, uh, putting up a set of rules that is a, a, truly a landmark, one of the most significant reforms of ethics in the history of the House. And there, it, we started with holding ourselves to a higher standard, uh, and it was just clearly consistent with everything that he has said. Of, he wants us to be principled legislators and to vote on principle and stick to those principles and to govern how we campaigned uh, and that to the extent there are any inconsistencies with what we campaigned on um, that that voters you know should hold us accountable for it and that he's not going to support us. Senator Broxson you want to comment on Senator leadership? Well President Negron is a brilliant attorney who has dedicated himself to public service and uh, he's very thoughtful and we're we're curious it's going to be a change in our rules how, how they compare to the House but I'm committed, and I think he is, along with the other leadership positions, to making sure that we work it out respectfully with the House. Very good. We have many questions from our listeners and viewers tonight, so I'm going to get down to brass tacks here, so to speak, and start uh, relaying some of those questions to you gentlemen here. Uh, first question from a viewer, do any of you plan to sponsor or support legislation that deals with the impending teacher shortages facing many districts? If so, what solutions would you propose? Well, I want my other colleagues to speak. I am on the Educational Appropriations K-12, through and we've already had two sessions of testimony about the shortage of teachers. One of the things that Senator Montford is going to offer is that we let, allow, after a person has used DROP, to come back into the system immediately and not have to wait. That will infuse a lot of talent, a lot of enthusiasm back into the system. I think that will pass because one, we need the teachers, and the other is because they, a lot of them still want to work. Mm -hmm. So that will be an immediate impact, and we, we've got to uh, encourage our teachers more. There, there's a lot of teachers around the state are despondent about the many changes that we've imposed on them. I think you're going to see some of that uh, reduced, primarily in testing, and that's going to increase uh, enthusiasm about being in the classroom teaching. I mean, from the House perspective, I actually sit on four education committees. One of them, uh, like uh, Senator Broxson, is the ed overall education committee. That particular topic has not been brought before us yet. We, at this point in time, from an education perspective, we're focusing on, I'm on the pre-K through 12 innovation, and we're looking at um, not only uh, supporting the public school system, but also looking at ways that how can we bring the best educational opportunity to our children through a charter, um, increasing choice, uh, things of that nature. And so thus far we've been looking at uh, some other charter opportunities, choice opportunities. We've had some public uh, school districts come in and present before us. I think Lee County was one uh, excellent system in terms of how they do choice within their footprint. Uh, but I do believe, as Senator Broxton talked about, there's some reform coming that I think is, uh, will be um, probably embraced and, and heavily looked at. Um, but it hasn't come over to, to our committee thus far, but I'm sure it will be coming up. 
Okay. Anybody else like to add in on the education at this point in time? Here's another question from a viewer uh, still kind of on the education. Um, she says President Trump recently prohibited the EPA from discussing information about climate change through social media, raising concerns about transparency and his commitment to the advancement of scientific knowledge. What are your plans for supporting scientific research and STEM, um, science, technology, engineering, and math education in the state of Florida? We have some pretty cool uh, opportunities here. L let me go back. L let me frame it like this. When I was, uh, you know, young, uh, early elementary school, um, uh, you know, math was not something and science was not something that I found exciting or, or saw, you know, opportunities for a career, even though my dad was an engineer, just was not something that appealed to me. But we have some pretty unique opportunities specifically here in the Panhandle. I point to things like the National Flight Academy, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, uh, I, I, if you can take a kid and put them in the flight academy, let them see that science, mathematics, engineering, these things have an application in a, a career field that can make you successful. It's fun, it's entertaining. Uh, it could really change your way of thinking and, and turn kids on to science, technology, engineering, mathematics at an early age in a, in a way that's uh, not seeing it in a textbook or even you know a lab in a classroom. So uh, the more we can expose kids to those things early on, and support those uh, initiatives through, you know, um, state support. It's only going to help proliferate, you know, STEM in the state of Florida. I'd like to add something? Sure. And, and so I had a teacher when I was growing up that said, "What's learned and fun is learned forever." Right. And, and it goes back to what Representative Ingram said. Um, we have so many different programs, robotics, and different things that children are doing as they they go through. And we have career academies now. Right. I'm an electrical contractor, so. I love the career academies where children go to school, they get certificates, they come out and they can join the workforce right out of high school. But it's using your hands and doing certain things that the textbook's not going to provide. Um, I think that we're going to really do a good job in the state of Florida to expand career academies. I hope. I don't sit on any of the education committees like Representative Ponder, but it's certainly something that I would support. Yes, go ahead. On Speaking to the research funding part of the question, I mean, we, we spend a massive amount of money funding education in the state. It's the second largest portion of the state, portion of the state budget. Um, a significant amount of, of that funding, funding goes to colleges and universities uh, where faculty, part of their main job is, is pushing a research agenda. Um, we also hear not only in, in education, but also in IHMC, a, a local gym from of Northwest Florida, mm -hmm. something we're all very proud of. Um, doing cutting level, cutting edge um, robotics um, research, uh, right. and so the the state is very involved in in scientific research yeah. appropriately. Uh, uh, Senator Brock, oh, good. We spend way too much money on on testing, and we know that. If you take our total budget, we spend seventy two million dollars a day for teachers. Twenty one of those days every year is spent away from the classroom in testing at these kids. That amounts to over a billion dollars. We've always been told that it's the hardware cost, the $110 million that we actually spend for the books and sending the test out and grading them. But it's really over a billion dollars that we're wasting teachers' time, their ability to do what they were trained to do, and that's to teach. And we, we're gonna address that this year. And I think you're going to see the morale of teachers across the state go up because they'll be able to do what they need to do, and that's teach children. Jeff, I had one quick thing, sure. just because it's been brought up, and just to highlight the importance of, of what we're all talking about with STEM, specifically in some mm -hmm. of the, the research thing that's been talked about. In Northwest Florida, we, have, we do have a diverse business community, which is fantastic, but closer to my district, you know, two of the major uh, industry are military, number mm -hmm. one, and tourism. And so we, I believe, thinking outside the box, need to start helping build or create this third, fourth, or even a fifth leg to the stool economically for our area. And STEM is a big part of it. But if we don't introduce some of these children to the, the career opportunities by getting this great training to engage them and encourage them, then when we look at robotics, manufacturing, um, you know, the studies have shown that in the next five years, you know, all the assembly line work will be done with robots. And so we got to have people that are trained now ready to work on them, and we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. And so if we want to start attracting some of these opportunities for these children that are in STEM now, so there's workforce opportunity on the back end, we need to start looking at things and highlighting them so that they are trained now with the mindset and excitement as was discussed so that when they graduate, hey, I want to be in those fields. Right. And I think that will diversify our economy even more and strengthen us. Okay, very good. Another question from a viewer. Do any of you support the use of school vouchers? That is giving tax credits from public school funds to families to use for private school tuition. If so, what possible negative effects do you think it might have on public education? 
School vouchers, that's something that's been kicked around for years. Yeah, right. something we've probably all, uh, in theory, uh, supported in some way, shape, or form. Uh, but, you know, the Supreme Court now has opened the door for, for <clears> that to really happen in the state of Florida uh, by rejecting a, uh, you know, a, a lawsuit that had made it all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, so I, I think that's something that really has a chance to happen now, a reform that we may see put into to play and, and uh, shake things up. Okay. Let's move on to business. Uh, one of our viewers is asking the question. Uh, she says, most job creation comes from small business. How can we help small businesses out in order to facilitate more jobs? In other, in other words, how can we help small businesses grow? I think is the real question. And anybody take it? Representative I think, White? I think the number one thing we can do is to keep regulations low. So there, there is so much regulation right now that isn't tied to any kind of rational connection to protecting consumers or anything else. It's just, it's there because 30 years ago it maybe made sense to the legislature or, or a special interest and it was shoved in and that's it and it's still there. And that's how we today have a society where we're, I think, massively over-regulated. And that cost of, comp of compliance with those regulations mm -hmm. is crippling on small business. So that's number one. Number two would be a low tax climate. Uh, there is, is taxes are, are something that we in our in our state luckily have have cut and those who are experienced members here uh, Senator Broxton and, and uh, Representative Ingram have voted consistently to cut taxes and that's something that I'm going to continue to do um, in the legislature it's just a, a low tax climate is so much better than um, a climate of oppressive taxation one other thing too in addition to what Representative White is talking about um, those are cores obviously core and foundational but as as a state we're the only state in the country that has a commercial lease tax uh, us in the New York City has one as well, and, and I know uh, the budget as a whole may not be there this year perhaps to absorb some of that, but in time we need to really look at eliminating and or reducing that to eventual elimination of the commercial lease tax. That would actually free up uh, cash flow for small business, especially either to market more, hire more, uh, expand their business perhaps. Um, and so that's another uh, tax savings I think eventually we need to embrace and push towards, if not this year because of budget constraints, definitely in, in out years we need to bring that into the fold. Okay, very good. You're watching Legislative Review on WSRE Television. If you have a question, you can email us uh, your question. Questions at WSRE.org is the email address, and they will pass it on to me, or you can give us a call at 850-484-1223. That's 850-484-1223, or toll free at 1-800-239-WSRE. Moving back to education, except this time we'll go to higher education. Um, a viewer asked, where do you stand on increased funding for the University of West Florida and Pensacola State College? Will anybody take that again and jump ball? Well, 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 locally, if not, I'll be glad to. Well, I, I know we're all in favor of funding, you know, Pensacola State and UWF, you know, at the highest level possible, uh, you know, whether it be capital outlay funding for uh, uh, UWF to complete some projects or, or Pensacola State to finish the uh, the bars building uh, construction. But, like, specifically, you know, I know Representative Ponder's on the Education Committee and Senator Broxson as well. They may have more specific answers. But, like, I mean, globally, we're, we're over there fighting for home, and like that's obviously something we want to do and do right. I'd say, I mean, obviously, it's not my district, but I want to I want to speak in support of, of Representative Ingram, what he's talking about. I know Representative White has this as well. Um, Dr. Saunders and Dr. Meadows are, are great people of vision, um, and I love what they're thinking. They're thinking not just um, jurisdictionally over Pensacola; they're thinking regionally. And I think for us, having the asset of both those colleges and universities <laughs> in our district is a gift. And when and where appropriate, as Representative Ingram talked about, they both have some funding needs that obviously if we can continue to enhance and grow them. But as they um, find their niche and their vision and mission, we want to come behind them and help them fulfill that. Uh, but both of them are key uh, uh, institutions of higher learning in Northwest Florida. And I know I'm probably speaking on behalf of all of us, so we're very honored there to have them both in our, in our footprint. Please. Just one other thought that, that I want to I I share is that <coughs> In, in, my, in my day job with, with the Sansing dealerships, I talk, see a lot of people pass through who in talking about buying a car. And so many people in our area have massive student debt. Mm. And it's, you know, I, I see the faces of it every day, and I think we all do, many of us probably do. It's just, it, it's a fact of our economy today that 20 to 30 years ago we didn't have. So uh, while I, I certainly support robust funding for, for higher education, for colleges and universities, uh, we also have to control 
how control the cost of college to the consumer, to that student. Um, one way can, we can do that is through more state funding. Another way is through making sure that degree programs are actually tied to jobs and tied to some of what Representative Williamson was talking about of you know, a, a good paying job there at the end and not being saddled with 50 grand of student debt and you're stuck without, without a job in your career field. And just a follow-up question on that, when Governor Scott came out with his budget today, $83.5 billion budget, proposed budget today, and one of the, uh, the items in there is that he wants to expand the Bright Future Scholarship Program. Your thoughts on that? I mean, obviously it's a, definitely an incentive for young ones coming through the high school ranks to earn uh, uh, tuition assistance and other things with college. And so uh, that is something that I know we're, we, I'm on the Higher Education Appropriations Subcommittee, and so that's going to be something we'll be looking at as part of our budget, um, uh, how that factors in. And I think there's also some legislation on the table that's even talking about expanding Bright Futures to cover summer school in addition to year-round. Um, and so looking at that alone, it, it clearly would say that there might be some additional funding needed for that. Uh, and that's something we're definitely going to evaluate. Okay. Anybody else like to follow up on that? Okay. Uh, speaking of, of funding, uh, we talked a lot about STEM, uh, more technical type stuff. Uh, the viewer, a viewer, is asking a question, how important is arts funding in the state of Florida? I, I think, you know, I, I might step out on a limb. You know, I, I kind of look at, I think everyone's created differently and unique. And, and one person may have a call or a purpose or identity that makes them better in sports. One might be mathematics, one could be in engineering. Um, the arts is a field that I think you can see a lot of creative genius come out. Um, and not only arts itself, but also um, even art therapy. Um, it allows um, maybe the gift or true talent. Sometimes if they go through the you know, traditional school system, they learn reading, writing, English, arithmetic, those core things. Sometimes it's when you plant them in the field of art, you, get, you see their creative genius come alive. And so I, to the element and to the extent we can, I think integration with that is, a, is key. Um, because a lot of times if you want everyone to come out as a square peg, then force them through the same way. But if you want to actually have them come out and be um, excited about who they are, their gift and talent, and plant it into a community where they can thrive as opposed to just feel like robotic almost, then I think we're missing the mark not stewarding our, ki our kids well. And so I believe art does play a vital role in our education com community. Jeff, we talk a lot about STEM. Mm -hmm. uh, you might have heard this, uh, but it's, it's talked about now, the acronym STEAM, STEAM which yeah. includes arts, which uh, at face value maybe doesn't make sense. But the thought process, uh, process is that uh, if you think about things like gaming and uh, you know, uh, graphic arts, graphic design, a lot of those fields take uh, an uh, artistic component and then a, a very mathematical, you know, uh, analytical component as well combined to give someone a very lucrative career. And so uh, I think that that's a very practical way that the arts and, and traditional STEM uh, focus can come together to, to create, uh, you know, to help people get jobs that are meaningful, fulfilling, uh, and allow them to, you know, uh, entertain a little artistic flair along with, you know, the math and science. Well, I think the folks at Apple, Steve Jobs, and, and uh, the, uh, would probably tell you that uh, the, the artistic design initially of the iPod, uh, I think Johnny Ives was the gentleman who designed that, made a huge difference in the amount of uh, devices they sold. So, you know, clearly there's, there's a prime example of what you're talking about. If I could say this, we have over 40 colleges and universities, and they offer a diverse uh, choice of what you want to do. If you want to concentrate on any of these areas, you can go to a university of your choice. The question is, make sure you choose a university and the right subject, because to go in as a freshman and thinking what you're going to be when you're a senior, you can, like uh, Representative uh, said earlier, that you can build up a phenomenal debt that will follow you the rest of your life, and we do not want to see that. Yeah. Good point. Um, a viewer question, do you support the purchase of land for preservation as mandated by the Florida Constitution? Wanna... Well, I think that's talking about Amendment 1 that was passed. It's a big controversy of what we should do with that money. The legislature has taken that money and tried to apply it to things that we've already purchased and to be, do a better job of being a, a landlord of what we own, along with the other water projects that we have to do. So. I think we've taken the right direction. When those people stood in line to vote on that amendment, I would say very few of them knew exactly how that money would be spent. It was a concept, and we're trying to work out the concept as well as we can. Okay. 
Well, it always comes up in this session. Uh, <laughs> Representative Ingram and uh, Senator Broxson probably know where I'm going with this. It's the marijuana question. It always seems to come up on a couple of different uh, stools, so to speak. So a uh, question from a viewer is, when will medical marijuana become available for people who need it? And then I'm just going to go ahead and do the follow up. Would you support an amendment for recreational use of marijuana in Florida? So uh, two questions from two separate viewers. Yeah, I don't want to uh, jump if somebody else has a, an opinion. But um, when, when we look back to the Charlotte's Web law from a few years ago, um, th that was a, a landmark uh, you know, movement from where, you know, when I was elected in 2010, if you told me that the Florida legislature, uh, you know, would pass any form of legalization, I just probably would not have believed you, but uh, you know there, there were some some very uh, moving examples of why uh, medicinal non-euphoric marijuana was good for the people of the state of Florida that that needed it. Uh, it was a, a great case was made. Uh, you know it was voted, accepted, and signed into law by the governor. Uh, the process of creating rules and you know f f determining who could grow, who could not grow, how you know the product would be distributed. Uh, the devil was in the details there, and it took a long time. For that to, to happen and so I guess my, my thought and I don't know if this answers the viewers question specifically but um, with medical marijuana legalization we need to get the regulatory role right uh, the, the rulemaking uh, you know process that, that's going to happen needs to be done uh, as speedily as possible because people you know need the product but we need to make sure that we get that right we don't want to necessarily I don't think we want to be uh, California with Dr. Feelgoods on every corner after the 2011 problem that we have just started to solve of the pill mill uh, problem where we had you know uh, pills distributed everywhere we were sort of the laughing stock of the country that you could come here and uh, get painkillers and take them and sell them other places so uh, coming out of that uh, just making sure we get the rules right is important but I hope we do it speedily uh, and that's something that I uh, am in favor of and, and hoping that we get that, that done quickly. Representative Williamson. Thank you and, and I think uh, Representative Ingram is Absolutely right. We have to get the rules right, and, and, it's, and it's a big task. What I don't want is I don't want the system where somebody comes to Disney World, they use their hotel room as an address, they get um, have a cough or arthritis, and then they are able to get marijuana. That's not the system that I want in place. I doubt that's the system uh, that others want in place. But I have a constituent, and they have to take their child to, I believe it's um, Baltimore, mm -hmm. um, to, for creams and rubs because right. the child has epileptic seizures. Right. So. That's somebody who, who needs um, right. medical marijuana, but it's going to be a very fine line on how we do this correctly, um, and it's going to be a big task over the next session. What, what, do you, what do you think the time frame? Anybody want to offer a time frame? Will it happen this time? Well, the Department of Health is promulgating the rules. They have until July 1st, and then after that, hopefully they'll have, you know, the, the problem is that this did not go through the <clears throat> legislature in a formal way. So there was no debate, no committees, no way to implement the law. It was a citizen-driven legislation. Now we have to interpret what that means, and the Department of Health, without the help of the legislature, is going to do that, and uh, hopefully for those people that medically need it, within uh, the next few months there will be a system set up that they can easily go if they get a order from a doctor, they can go and uh, get their needs taken care of legally. Okay. Anybody else? I want to add on top of all that is, um, in addition, I mean, doing it the right way is important. I'd, I had the honor to get to know a state representative from Colorado just over the phone uh, recently about this issue. And um, she had some comments personally about, you know, stepping into this, but we're here. We had an overwhelming majority of the state approve it, but doing it the right way is going to take a lot of wisdom for the, how we put things in motion. They've got, she was telling me that they have every border state suing them because of people crossing the border, getting medical marijuana or full access of legal marijuana. Uh, recreational use and coming back in because they're not they don't know how to handle it mm -hmm. and so I think the wisdom that we'll need to em implore is just hey, how do we handle what we've got and then making sure is what's been said do it the, do it the right way uh, so that the ones that truly need it as Representative Williams talked about are getting access to it and getting it um, and make sure that you know the state state of Florida um, you know I think you know our vision is family and that's kind of who we are and so you know go, doing this the right is real important because before we even want to entertain stepping into full recreational marijuana I think we got to get this first step really sound and right, and I don't want us to become known for something we're not. So the second question that the viewer offered up, uh, would you support an amendment for recreational use of marijuana? And I'll I take it probably, I would not support that right now. Yeah, nobody's on board with that, I'm assuming. 
from what you were saying. <laughs> okay, because that'd be breaking news tonight. If it was okay. Um, once again, we're getting a, a lot of uh, great questions in from our viewers and listeners, and you can certainly email your question in to uh, questions at wsre.org. Um, we, I'm, I'm going to ask this, but we, we sort of covered it, but I, I'll ask it again uh, because a viewer sent the question in. When will you allow teachers to stop teaching to the test and get back to teaching the basics of reading, science, math, etc.? I mean, that's kind of what you covered to begin with. If you just want to quickly reiterate, that's sort of what one of your goals is, correct, Senator Broxson? That's what we're hearing from every 67 jurisdictions that uh, we are, and it's actually showing up in the college student, too. We're doing some surveys with uh, university and colleges and asking them in the, five, in the last five years, has their student knowledge and base changed? What are they looking for? And each one has said that there is a change, that we have less deductive thinking coming from high school because we are training students to look for a test, to look for an answer, and that's their goal. So we've got the message. I think you'll see some changes. It may not be all the changes this year, but there will be a progression over the next few years to try to test where we need to test to get an accurate account of what's being learned, but not to over-test, not to spend over a billion dollars of classroom time when we should be teaching these kids the fundamentals of education. Anybody else like to piggyback on that or pretty much everyone in agreement, I'm assuming? Moving on to another viewer question. Will you support reforming the antiquated, and according to the viewer question here, antiquated law on alimony in this state and give people going through the divorce process a more objective outcome than the subjective way that alimony is now processed in the state? Viewer goes on to mention this is the fourth year in the road that alimony reform has been addressed by our state government. And mm -hmm. um, he says uh, this year's bill is uh, House Bill 283 and uh, Governor vetoed a couple of bills in the past. So. Sort of what's the status of that this year? Representative White? I'm on a committee that will actually be hearing proposals on, on alimony. I don't, I don't believe one has been filed in the House yet. Um, but I have heard anecdotally that our alimony statute is antiquated. And, and clearly the legislature thinks so, having passed a bill <laughs> several years in a row. Um, it just sounds like it hasn't, we haven't gotten it right yet. So I'd, I'd be interested to hear you know, what my colleagues who were here in the past on what some of those debates were about. Um, Sure. Jeff, there, there are several pieces to the bill that we passed out of the House, uh, several, probably four times is accurate. Um, there's a financial piece, and I think that's where a lot of the, the rub comes in uh, with regard to how you would treat, uh, you know, alimony cases. L looking back, they call it the tail. Uh, how far back do you go to, to look at how the, the financial split ought to be and, and how, how would it be equitable? Uh, aside from that, though, there's the, the parental uh, split with, when children are involved. And so uh, the, a lot of the controversy surrounds the financial part, less surrounds the, the part that deals with, uh, you know, the, the presumed uh, custody uh, scenario when, when parents divorce. And so a bill was filed, I think it was filed today or yesterday, uh, by Senator Brandis in the Senate uh, that deals specifically and only with the, you know, uh, custody portion. And it, it takes away the assumption that one parent or the other, one sex or the other, uh, is presumed to have more custody uh, than the other. And so... Um, as the financial piece is worked out, uh, at least the, the other part that has less uh, chance of getting vetoed or, uh, or, or not making it through the process will be vetted. So uh, just for the viewer's benefit, although the full uh, bill will probably be heard at some point, like uh, Representative White said, uh, the, the other portion that, that is critical for you know, parental and, and, and child development is, is out there already, so that's good. Okay. Anybody else like to add in on that? Okay. Um, another viewer question, would you consider simplifying the licensing process for construction contractors? I'll throw that up to anyone who would like to address it. I mean, so being in the electrical field, I deal with licensing a lot. I don't know the specifics on, on the questions. I think there is good to have some type safety guard. Um, if you take a look at before the storm, how many different contractors we had in Northwest Florida compared to after Hurricane Ivan, and it, you go in a phone book and what used to be, say, 20 or 30 heat and air and electrical contractors or plumbing contractors, and now you have hundreds and hundreds. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there has to be some safety guard when it comes to license to make sure for consumer protection. Uh, but I don't, I don't know. I would like to know specifically more what they, they meant on that. Okay. 
Here's a, and, and, and he or she did not say, so I'm not, not entirely sure on that. Another question sort of in the same uh, ballpark here, uh, hip roof slash windstorm insurance. Will you sponsor a bill that grandfathers hip roofs uh, in, and she says, or he says that they were covered. She says, actually, they were covered a few years ago. Are you guys familiar with that? I'm not, unfortunately, um, not entirely sure what uh, what the viewer is talking about on that. So maybe she can contact whoever her representative is well, you, locally. You do get a credit for a hip roof. They have been proven to be uh, more, when you have storms, they divert the wind in areas that cause less destruction. I think all those things are pretty well close, closely looked at by the department to make sure that the rates reflect what's a safer building or safer home. So. I'm not sure there's a lot to be done as far as revising that at this point. Okay. Another viewer question here. How about more funding for DCF and other programs that fail, his words, uh, to serve the public because they lack the resources to train and supervise staff? Anybody like to address that on DCF and the, and the funding? Well, they get plenty of funding. Uh, it's, it's a very complicated issue when you're dealing with children and the elderly and uh, there's, we've got massive problems in Florida. The people that come to Florida every day mostly are retired and they're going to have needs that for the rest of their life. And dealing with people's children is always a complicated issue. And we have a lot of dedicated people across the state that do the very best they can, but they do make mistakes and in many cases they're underpaid for the work they do. But uh, we're working on that and hopefully we're going to be better this year than we were last year. Please. Mm -hmm. Jeff, I'd, you know, not to speak to the specific funding level of DCF, which I, you know, I, I candidly, I need to learn more about the specific funding level, but I do have a bill uh, that would relieve some strain from the system. Um, specifically, it's, it's called Safe Families, and this bill would allow uh, nonprofit organizations to recruit, do full DCF background checks um, on families that would serve as a respite family, as a, as a family that would, that would be there to help another family in need. Um, the, the concept is that when DCF goes in, goes in to take, uh, take a child, go to step into a, to the situation where we've got, where the state, the government says this child's interests is so great, we've got to pull this child away from his parents. When DCF takes that, that step, before they do, there are dozens of touch points with various people where that, that family in crisis we could have stepped in and helped in some way. And so what my bill would do would allow uh, counties across the state to set up nonprofit organizations like we have here at Bethany Christian Services in Escambia County and um, train volunteer families, typically from churches, to step in and, and provide help to that family in need. Uh, if that included taking care of that child for, on a temporary basis, it would provide for it. Um, but it's a, it's a wonderful way that would relieve stress from that system in, and keep kids out of the system because once a kid goes into into foster care it's typically two years before um, before it all shakes out and the child is either ideally restored to the parents or if that can't happen in a safe way sent into the foster care system anybody else like to add to that I, mean, I, I would just like to add that i don't think that we should always look at more funding as the um, you know, solving every issue that we have in government. Sometimes it's being more efficient. I sit on Children, Families, and Seniors, which is um, a subcommittee, uh, so I will look forward to learning more about DCF and we have over the last couple weeks of committees, but uh, government should always not be just throwing more money. At, if you have a problem, it's not all about funding. Maybe it's about being more efficient with the money that we do have. Very good. We are uh, talking with our Northwest Florida legislative delegation tonight, and we've gotten many great questions from viewers and listeners. If you would like to uh, submit a question, you can do so via email, questions at WSRE.org. That's questions at WSRE.org, or call us at 850-484-1223 or 800-239-WSRE. We certainly uh, would appreciate your uh, questions this evening. School choice, what is the fix for failing urban schools is school choice the answer question from a viewer please uh, representative white i i think so i, I think you know our, our particularly my colleagues from around the, from from the urban areas in the state um, they they talk about schools in their areas as failure factories and where children are literally they are they are stuck in a system that has consistently failed to produce 
and you know, failed to serve that child. Now, I, we ask a lot of our teachers and of our educators in this state. We ask, we ask them to solve, not just educate the child, but take care of so many other needs that 20, 30, 40 years ago um, we didn't ask of them. But still, I, I love the principle of allowing more choice, giving more parents more choice, beginning with that principle of letting that parent decide what is best for his or her child um, is going to, that's going to result in, in stronger schools, better choices for kids. Okay. Here's another question from a um, viewer, and I'm not sure that this is something at the legislative level, but nonetheless, it's a topic that needs to be addressed. When are our school systems going to have a plan to handle bullies? That is a problem across the nation, quite frankly. Any thoughts on that? Well, I think that's a local issue. I mean, we have teachers and principals and school boards that should be dealing with those issues. I think if you were to ask all of our three superintendents that I represent, they do not want another mandate coming down from Tallahassee on how to handle their students. Mm -hmm. I believe we have capable, qualified people that know what's going on <clears throat> that should be dealing with those issues now. Okay. Here's a question from a viewer. What is your feeling about merging city and county government? Uh, she says it would eliminate so much redundancy and save incredible amounts of money. Are our local leaders savvy enough to see the good it would do for all and not just simply their personal gain or loss? Merging city and county government, your thoughts? Well, Representative? All, yeah, I mean, I think you know, Representative Williams and I might be able to, and maybe uh, since we come from the county, I come from the city. Um, you know, it, it, Every community has got its own charter and it's based on the vision and mission of that community. Uh, naturally, cities are all part wrapped up into a, a county. Um, and so there's interlocal agreements if it needs to be that way, but hopefully the, the, the respect not only flows from the city towards the county, but also vice versa. I um, mean, we all um, you know, need each other, we're all part of, and I don't care which, you know, if you look at, uh, in my case, Okaloosa County, I don't care if it's Crestview, Niceville, Destin, Fort Walton Beach, et cetera, we're all part of the same county, we're all part of the same family. And so, um, you know, areas where we can work together for efficiencies, economies of scale, uh, if there's overlapping <coughs> services uh, that we need to kind of work together, we need to. Uh, if it's going to keep taxation lower, um, fees for services lower, then absolutely we need to work together. Um, at the same time, part of why communities sometimes incorporate is because they want um, the building standards to be a little different or parks and recreation or, or municipal, municipal services, et cetera. And so from that regard, I think there needs to be a healthy um, teamwork relationship but but not uh, and work where we can but not necessarily uh, dissolve that line in, in coming from county government we have areas <coughs> in Santa Rosa County that um, are not incorporated and they get the services that they feel are fit for what they want in government um, oftentimes and we have had this in the past as well in the past two years in Santa Rosa County where we had a certain area that looked to incorporate and it, and it went to a vote for straw poll and the people voted against it so um, when you're going to vote but to become incorporated, you're also taking another layer of government. Some people want that, some people don't. And I don't think that that's anything as far as the state level to do a blanket um, legislation because that, that would have to fit those communities and those counties and those um, uh, municipalities. Okay. Anybody else like to add on? Or Okay, very good. Here's one that we probably all think about um, at least once a year when we pay our insurance bill. <laughs> it says, since we have had so few hurricanes recently, when will more insurance companies come back to compete with lower insurance rates? Great question. And I think some of that is actually starting to happen. I believe more, f more firms are beginning to move into the state of Florida. But uh, you guys want to elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, well, actually, rates would be lower now if it was not for a new phenomenon that's hit Florida, primarily the southern part of Florida, and that's assignment of benefits, primarily with water claims. You have a broken pipe, someone comes in, and before the insurance company is notified, they uh, have a thirty dollars or $40,000 bill, and then they give it to the company or they assign it to the benefits away, and the companies lose the ability to adjust their own claims. This is a phenomenal phenomenal problem in South Florida. All claims that are related to water, almost all claims are presented with an assignment of benefit clause. And uh, it is going to be a rate maker. Citizens has already affected their rate. And we're not seeing companies right now asking for rate decreases. They're asking for increases. <clears throat> and this really should not happen 10 years after a major storm hit Florida. People are paying a tremendous amount of dollars for homeowners and business insurance, and it should be coming down. If the free market, if people were just 
uh, dealing with traditional claims, it would, but now we're creating ways to access the policies that we've never done before. Hmm. Anybody else like to add to that? The viewer's correct. I mean, actuarially, with regard to the storms, that was a problem. But uh, during the Chris governorship, uh, insurance companies were so demonized that they chose to leave, which obviously affected the, the market. Create, you know, there were less companies, less policies to choose from. And so uh, it was sort of a double whammy uh, of, uh, you know, actual, you know, storms having to be, you know, policies having to pay out. And then uh, also uh, a governor just telling the companies they weren't welcome here. And so uh, I think we've seen the pendulum swing back the other way. And then uh, as Rep. Uh, Senator Boxen, sorry about the, uh, the motion there, uh, but, but uh, as the Senator said, you know, uh, now, now there are new uh, troubles on the horizon, so uh, we'll have to be vigilant against that. Let me hit on a few things that are likely to come up and be discussed this year. Um, funding for, uh, this is something I guess is kind of different, perhaps you can explain it a little bit, and, and I'll, since you, you're the veteran of the group, I'll, I'll, I'll gear it towards you, Representative Ingram. Um, in the House, funding request as a bill versus being tacked on as legislation, that's something Speaker Corcoran has brought to the table. What does that mean? Yeah, it, it's another layer. We, we talked about, uh, you know, sort of the rejection of status quo and, and uh, increased transparency and accountability. It's another layer, and the Senate has a similar process. There's not an actual bill that has to be filed, but a similar process to uh, r r vet projects and then make members own up to the fact that they are putting in a, a request for a certain amount of money for a certain group. And I think the, the scenario that... Um, uh, this, this group is not guilty of this, but we see it from uh, colleagues from other parts of the state. They uh, request money for things and for groups and special interests that, um, you know, I think if their constituents knew that they were requesting money for certain groups and certain things, they would be uh, outraged and horrified. And so uh, this process is a way to fully vet, fully get out in public, uh, you know, what you're requesting, who it's for, who, you know, what the, the money, the end user, uh, the vendor, who, who would be paid. Uh, when, when that's out there, it's nothing but good, and I'm, I'm glad to see a more transparent process. Great. Uh, Amtrak, uh, viewer asked the question, what can you do to restore funding and service between Jacksonville and Pensacola? Anybody want to take that one? Like the idea? No? <laughs> also, it's at, at the state level, probably not a lot. But uh, look, in, in, uh, man, I, probably all of us would love to ride from Pensacola or, or, or Destin to Tallahassee and be able to work and make phone calls and, and, and not drive as often. But, uh, you know, the, the problem with, with Amtrak is just the uh, ridership and the fact that it, it is a, a, a loser with regard to money. And so, uh, until, you know, if the federal government wanted to subsidize uh, the, the process, that would probably be the, the magic bullet that would make it happen. President of Ponder seems like he might yeah, have more information. Say, you know, what a great problem to have that we're, we're jockeying that idea. I know in my, my district, um, Crestview is a city that would love to have a stop. And I know one district over, when, uh, Representative Drake, is, is Defuniac. Mm. And so um, uh, it's exciting to think about the possibility of having Amtrak make that run. But as Representative Ingram said, it, I don't believe the state's going to be looking to subsidize that. It may have to come from a different bucket from the federal level. Very good. We have about uh, roughly five minutes left or so. Let me hit on one more issue that uh, is likely to come up and, and again probably be quite contentious. Guns on college campuses. Uh, your thoughts? I'll, I'll put that up to anyone who wants to address it. I, uh, I think it's going to happen this year. Uh, if you look at both college <laughs> campuses, they are little cities. If you go to Tallahassee and look at Florida State, I defy you to tell me where the college begins and the city, and the city ends. And there are problems there, and people have a right to defend themselves. So I think you'll see uh, Senator Stubbe will carry it in the Senate, and I believe you'll see it uh, go through the Senate, and I would suppose the House will have a companion bill that will deal with the same issue. Okay, very good. Um, just a question in real quick, and I, I'm not sure if you can answer this or not, but uh, she says, I'm a 28-year-old high school teacher. I have cancer and I've had to take personal leave. I've earned uh, uh, sick leave hours but not allowed to use them since I am new to the district. Why will the state not let me use the hours I've earned just because they keep districts separated? Is that something any of you can address or perhaps she could call she you? should call one of our offices right. and let us do it. On an individual it. basis and find out more about that. Uh, just a few minutes left. Let me just get you all to sort of uh, wrap up what you hope to accomplish uh, in the in the 2017 year. And uh, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll reverse it this time around. I'll begin with you, Representative Ponder. Thank you. Well, Jeff, thanks again uh, for the honor to be here. We appreciate the invite and, and uh, to be here and, and share our heart and values, I think, is important. Plus, it gives the viewers a chance to know us a little bit more and what we stand for. You know, for me, um, 
I was really thankful that I was be, had the honor to be on four different education committees. Education is important to me. It's important to Northwest Florida. Uh, what we do with children, not only um, as they come to K through 12, but beyond for those that do choose to go beyond is important. And I think how it helps establish and further a culture. And so for me, uh, having the honor to serve on the appropriation side as well as the, the legislative side is big. So I'd love to um, help us uh, continue to put colleges where they need to be in our, in our regional region. I look at Northwest Florida State and Dr. Stevenson over there is they're the only college we have even in our footprint. So making them applicable and, 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 and uh, you know, a role to play is important. So that honor our military, continue to enhance and strengthen them as much as we can, as well as preserving those values I talked about in Northwest Florida. Got a little less than three minutes. Yeah, I want to get everyone sure. in, uh, yeah. Representative well, Thank you for having us here tonight. And it's great to be with a great group of, of public servants. Um, we have a great team that's going to Tallahassee and it's going to take teamwork for us to do anything. And, and it's nice to have people that you want to see um, after hours. You, you want to come to this event tonight and see these guys because we don't always get to see each other even in Tallahassee because we're working on different bills that we have. I'm on Transportation and Infrastructure Subcommittee, Ag and Natural Resources Subcommittee, Waterways and Roadways, very important to the region, very important to me. Look forward to being a voice and eyes and ears um, for the constituents in Tallahassee. 995 3698 is our office number. If anybody needs anything in District 3, just let us know. Wonderful representative point. Yes, thank you again for having us. This is a fantastic uh, opportunity. It, in, it, serving in the House is the, it is the honor of my life. And it is, it is hard work, it is long hours. It is a tremendous privilege and honor to be able to do it. Um, I'm, I'm, it, is a bl it is a blast, it is a lot of fun. I think we'd all say we really, really deeply enjoy it. Um, it's, it's something that not, we, we do not take lightly though. We, one thing we need is we absolutely need input from everybody. Everybody who wrote sending questions tonight, send them, send them to, our, to our staff, send them to us. We, email, we each read our email every day and, uh, and answer phones and we'll, you know, we, we want to help and we need good ideas. The old veterans here, I'm going to have to cut them down to about 30 seconds apiece. <laughs> Jeff, I'm just so thrilled to have, you know, obviously Senator Broxson in the Senate, but th these three guys, the, the House members, are so talented, so intelligent, so smart. Uh, Northwest Florida is going to be in great hands in the next eight years. I'm, I'm so thrilled to work with these guys. I just want to, I, I know the viewers can see that for themselves tonight, but I'm, I'm thrilled to have these guys as teammates. I just want to echo that. I can tell you about this group here. If you go to Tallahassee, their behavior will be the same at Tallahassee at 1 o'clock in the morning as it is at home here. That is a unique statement for any group, and that's the reason that we work so well together is we have similar values. And the fact that the BP oil spill is requiring us to be a team from Tallahassee to Pensacola will be valuable for us to be trust each other and to know that we are covering each other's backs. Thank you all so very much, and, and I rest, uh, hopefully we'll see you all again after the session, and uh, we'll kind of uh, break down everything that, that happened during the 2017 legislative session. Gentlemen, thank you. Great deal uh, of uh, time spent uh, this evening, and we appreciate uh, you spending that time with us, and we wish you all the very best in the 2017 legislative session. Also, we'd like to thank you, my reviewers and listeners and constituents of Northwest Florida. We greatly appreciate all your questions. Our guests this evening have been members of the local Northwest Florida legislative delegation, Senator Doug Broxson, Representatives Clay Ingram, Frank White, J.R. Williamson, and Mel Ponder. Senator George Gaynor was unable to join us this evening due to a scheduling conflict. Tonight's broadcast has come to you from the Phyllis and Mike Johnson studio over the airwaves of WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast, and News Radio 1620 and 92.3 FM. I'm Jeff Weeks. I hope you have a wonderful, nice, enjoyable evening and enjoy the sunshine state of Florida. Good night, everyone. <laughs>